My name is Kai Bird. I am the director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography, a wholly unique institution hosted by the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and founded by Shelby White uh, and the Leon Levy Foundation in the year 2007. I want to thank Shelby for her steadfast support to the Biography Center. It is her vision that makes this program possible. Please note that our next event will take place on Monday, December 4th, right here in the Skylight Room on the ninth floor and online via Zoom. This 6.30 p.m. event will feature Jonathan Eig chatting with Harvard professor Randall Kennedy about his very stim stimulating new biography of Martin Luther King Jr. But tonight I'm delighted to introduce Professor Frank Costagliola. Did I pronounce that right? Uh, close enough, yes. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> who will be speaking with me about his important new biography, Kennan, A Life Between Worlds. Frank is a Board of Trustees Distinguished Professor at the University of Connecticut and a former president of the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations, Schaefer, which is the Organization for Diplomatic Historians. He is the author or editor of seven books, including The Kennan Diaries and Roosevelt's Lost Alliances. He has received fellowships from the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Norwegian Nobel Institute. And last, but certainly to be noted, Frank raises grass-fed beef cattle in Storrs, Connecticut. <laughs> so if you need any hamburger, just let me know. Please look for his books on bookshops.org, a site that will lead you to your local independent bookstore. We will now be in conversation for about 40 minutes and then we will take questions from our live audience. We will try to end this program after about one hour. And again, thanks to the Leon Levy Foundation for funding this and all our other events. Now let's discuss the life of George Kennan. So Frank, Frank, let's begin by just telling me a little bit about your journey on this biography. How, why did you land on this project and how long did it take and what were the challenges of writing a biography of someone who lived to be 101? Right, right. So that's one reason the book is so long. Um, <laughs> but the first thing I want to say that I'm, I'm really honored to be here uh, speaking with Kai and also because this is a Leon Levy and Shelby White uh, facility, you know, those are the people who, who donated the, the uh, funds for the archive at the Institute for Advanced Study. So that's where a lot of Kennan's papers are. And uh, also, I, I'm honored to be here with Kai because he obviously, as you all know, uh, was co-author of the biography of Oppenheimer, and Oppenheimer was a very good friend of Kennan. So there's a real coming together here of things, which I, which I appreciate. Now, the, the tougher question of <laughs> why everything. Well, you know, George Kennan is, I first read Kennan's memoirs as a graduate student in, in, when they came out in 1967. He writes beautifully. He writes beautifully. I mean, he, it's the, the story that Dean Acheson and other uh, top officials in the State Department said that is the dangerous thing about Kennan is that he writes so well that he can convince you of almost anything, even the worst ideas. Uh, and I think that gets at, that gets at, I'll get to the question in a minute, that gets to a key point here. That gets to a key point, and that it was easy for people at the top levels of the US government to dismiss what George Kennan had to say after 1950, when he became a critic of the Cold War. It was easy for them to dismiss what he had to say by saying that Kennan was so seductive in his writing that we should not really pay attention to the, uh, the, the gist, the content, the substance of his ideas. So I was, I was seduced by that, that writing, you know, the, reading his memoirs in 19, uh, when he came out in 1967. But um, I, I, I retained an interest in Ken, and then uh, I was at the Institute for Advanced Study in 2009-10 as a member, and uh, I was asked to give a seminar, a small seminar on Ken, and, and just at that point, uh, Kennan's papers, most of them are, some are at the Levy, archive, but most of them are at the Mud Library at Princeton, those papers just became available to ordinary mortals. They'd been in the sole, uh, uh, they'd been able to be used only by John Gaddis, the authorized biographer, until the 2009. So I started looking at Kenneth's diary, 
uh, his letters, and I became totally fascinated. And I'll have to say that, so that was 2009, this, this is almost, you know, it's, it's 14 years, and you know how you may get tired of a subject? I'm not tired of George Kennan. I, he's still a fascinating person. I mean, I think there's still so much there. So um, there was also, I think, that, that I, then I added that the Diaries of Kennan was published in 2014. Now, he, this is a person who started keeping a diary at the age of 11, 11. And he kept a diary from when he was 11 and, until he was 100 in, 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 the, uh, in 2000, uh, 2004. So there's a lot there. And, and it was condensing that that was a challenge, but also interesting. Uh, but it was also, I think, that you know, John Gaddis, I mentioned John Gaddis, wrote the authorized biography, which is a wonderful book. But I think it's limited. And any book is limited. My book is limited. But it's limited by John's particular perspective on Kennan. Kennan chose John Gaddis to write the authorized biography because Gaddis was an expert on the, the history of the immediate post-Cold War period when Kennan's containment doctrine enunciated in the famous Log Telegram and then in the Mr. X article in Foreign Affairs, when those were the, you know, shaping American foreign policy. And this is like 1946 through to, really, 1946 to the end of the Cold War. But the interesting thing to me was that Kennan, as early as the late 40s, by 49, certainly by 1950, was coming to think that containment was, was too limited a policy, that the United States should move beyond containment. Containment had basically worked. Kennan believed by 1950 or so, containment had basically worked that the United States should move in the dangerous nuclear environment that we live, the United States should move toward some kind of negotiations with the Soviet Union to ease tensions and try to in some way perhaps ease or even end the Cold War. And that's a, a, that was the prime focus for Kennan's life for the last 50 years, the last, last half century of his life, and it was a goal that Gaddis was not sympathetic with. So I thought that Kennan deserved his you know, an, another take on, on his life that would look at some of this. And one final thing is something else that Kennan was very concerned about, which is, I think, is really, uh, or two things that are really particularly relevant today, is that Kennan was a critic of industrialism, a critic of the mechanized, technological, you know, industrial society, which he saw as the origin, the really root of most of the problems of society. As Kennan put it, it was not, it was not that the, not just that factory bosses exploited workers in a capitalist society, or Communist Party bosses exploited workers in a communist society, but the factory itself was not the kind of environment that human beings should, should work in and not the kind of uh, situation that they should have governing their relations with each other and with nature. Kennan was an early environmentalist. And one, one final thing that makes Kennan, I think, particularly relevant today, even more than when I wrote this book, most of it was written in 2020, 2021, is that Kennan was a fervent advocate of diplomacy, of diplomacy as a way to get at problems which seem to be irreconcilable. As Kennan put it, what seems to be like irreconcilable differences is simply the, the asking price at the beginning of a long process of bargaining. So I think certainly today, uh, the world needs more diplomacy, and that's something that Kennan was very, very serious about. And I can talk more about what he meant by diplomacy, but that's so let, let's, you mentioned John Gaddis. Let's uh, talk about Gaddis for a moment. Not to say that we want to talk about his book and not your book, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's... He won the Pulitzer Prize and I didn't, he, so... He won the Pulitzer Prize. Yeah. He spent decades on this right. project. And he had a very peculiar uh, arrangement with... Kennan, can you describe that? Yes, uh, and it was originated in 1981, 82. Um, Kennan, George Kennan was, was very sensitive to criticism. He was a person who had a, a huge ego. Uh, but he was a person- You know, they say it's much harder to write about the living than the dead. Right, and the <laughs> arrangement, the arrangement, before, in 1981, 82, Gaddis volunteered to come to Kennan's defense in various issues that historians were, were debating. And that's how Kennan and, and Gaddis got to know each other. And then Gaddis proposed that he write the authorized biography of Kennan with the proviso that Gaddis would have sole access to George Kennan's papers until the biography was written. And also, 
also that the biography would not be published until after Kennan's death. Now, of course, this is at a time when Kennan, 1981, was 77, Gaddis was about 37, something. actually he was, he was born in 81, so he was, uh, Gaddis was, uh, uh, 1981 was, was, was exactly, oh, he was born in 41, so he was exactly 50. So expected within 10 years, the, the, uh, Kenner would be dead and the book would be published. And of course, the, the, the joke among Yale students where Gaddis teaching, was teaching is who would die first, Kenner or Gaddis? <laughs> so, okay, so the proviso was that the book would be. Uh, appear after. And, and he got exclusive access That's to right. Kennan's papers. So I Almost all the papers. going to Kennan's papers in Princeton and I couldn't, you know, I could see the, I could see some of the correspondence of people writing to Kennan, but you couldn't see Kennan's responses. Right. That's very true. And also what, what John did, which is a real service to other historians, he conducted some 30 interviews not just, he did six or seven long interviews with George Kennan and his wife, Annalisa Kennan, but he also conducted interviews with many other people, most of whom are now uh, past. So, and, that, and that's, they're available at the Mud Library. Also the audio, the audio is, of those interviews is available. And often the audio can give you uh, evidence that you just don't have from the written transcript. So yeah, that was a very close relationship that they had and um, yeah. So what, what, are, what are the major differences between the two books? I mean, you've hinted at the fact that Gaddis had a different, a different world view about the Cold right. War. I think he was much and, more conservative. Yeah, and as time went on, Gaddis became more and more conservative with regard to his views with regard to who was responsible for the origins and the continuation of the Cold War. I think that's, that's fair to say. You, you would agree with that. Uh, a second difference is I think my book is much, and I, of course I'm prejudiced, but... Um, I think my book is much more analytical. John's book is, is more encyclopedic. He'll have this, he has, he has not everything, but he has most of the major events of Kenna's life. I try to have more analysis of those events. I also try to focus more on Kenan's inner life. Now again, here's somebody who kept a diary, often a very revealing diary, for 88 years. And part, in many parts of Gaddis' book, he'll cite have a long quotation from the diary or a long quotation from a letter that Kennan wrote, but he doesn't analyze it. And I think that there was, there's, in terms of history, in terms of understanding, uh, trying to understand George Kennan, again, person I find fascinating, trying to understand him and his context and, and the importance of what he thought. And he was a very profound thinker in many ways. The analysis was more important. Uh, another thing is I had access or I found a lot of material, John had a lot of material, but I found even more material, including a, a Kennan, when Kennan joined the Foreign Service in 1926, okay, he was then uh, 22, year, 22 years old. He then rose faster, that, in the Foreign Service, rose faster than anyone in his age cohort. So, and why did he rise so fast? He rose so fast. He rose so fast because he wrote a series of papers, uh, reports, when he was in Riga, when he was in Moscow, uh, when he was in Berlin, he wrote a series of reports on all kinds of things which John did not know about. I mean, because basically I found kind of the, it's complicated with the archive, but I found the key to finding, you know, the papers that Kennan had written. And those papers really prepared Kennan to take over the job that he famously had in 1947 when he was the first, the founding director of the policy planning staff, where this purview was all of U.S. foreign policy, but Kennan had prepared himself for that in terms of all the work he had done in the years uh, before, before World War II. There's that. Uh, I also found, I, I think it's a fascinating part of the book, is that um, the financial records, think about this, the financial records of Kennan's father. Basically, it would be like the credit card statements of George Kennan's father. And that's important because I mean, think about this, if we're in New York City here. George Kennan's father, Kent Kennan, was one of the first experts on the income tax. Before the United States had an income tax, right? So there had to be the 16th Amendment to the Constitution permitted the levying of an income tax. And Kent Kennan studied the income tax, went to Germany, studied it in Germany and elsewhere, and testified to, to the US Congress about the advantages of having an income tax. And wrote a book published in 1910 on the inc comparing the income tax in different countries. So here was the first income tax lawyer. Now you would think that would be 
a means toward some kind of income. But for a reason I don't really understand why, uh, Kent Kennan made almost no money as a tax lawyer after the income tax was levied, enacted in the United States, and also the state of Wisconsin, where he lived in Milwaukee, had an income tax. Instead, Kent Kennan depended for the income that he had uh, uh, four children. His wife had died. The key element in George Kennan's early life is that Kennan's mother, George Kennan's mother died when he was two months old. And that was a, a trauma he never got over. So Kent Kennan, the father, depended for household expenses, the food, the electricity, the vacations, the, the automobile, all the ordinary household expenses depended for that, on that money from income that George and his three older sisters had inherited from their mother and from their mother's family. The, the, the mother came from a wealthy family. So in order to use that money for household expenses, Ken Kennan had to submit every month to the Milwaukee probate court an account of what George's allowance was, how much she, he spent on George's shoes, and so forth and so on. And so, as you can imagine, that kind of accounting gives you kind of an intimate view of what uh, their, their life was like. Yeah, invaluable for the biography. And it's also the case that, that uh, the mother's family, the, the deceased mother's family, hated Kent Cannon because he was not supporting his kids himself. He was using the money from uh, their sainted, deceased uh, George's mother. So Frank, let's get back to uh, your book, which, as you said, has a lot of analysis and commentary and is partly, you know, bi biography, but it's also sort of intellectual history about the, the, the wars between historians over the Cold War. And Kennan is right at the center of these, particularly as the sort of the schools, different schools of thought emerge between the orthodox and the revisionist schools on the Cold War. Can you describe that? Right, right, right. That, that, it's a little complicated, but I'll, I'll try to describe it. So as I said, George Kennan had, had an enormous ego. He, he had a, you know, he's a person, people have large egos who, for no reason, but Kennan, there was a reason. For, uh, he was a very talented foreign languages, brilliant writer, so forth and so on. Okay, so Kennan, he'd been present you know, at, at, the, at the origin of the Cold War. He wrote the Long Telegram, which was really a seminal document. He wrote it in February 19, uh, 22nd, 1946. And really, th th that long telegram, which was 5,000 words, the longest telegram ever sent to the uh, State Department, really provided the intellectual justification for the United States to pivot from trying to cooperate with the Soviet Union to pivot toward containment in the Cold War. And then he kind of did a kind of another version of that, the same kind of argument, published in Foreign Affairs in, in July 1947. That's the so-called Mr. X article. It's called Mr. X because it was first published anonymously. Okay, so Kennan played an important role in the formation of the containment doctrine uh, that the United States followed from 1946 on. Okay, and Kennan was it also, I should say here, because Kennan was so ambitious, he wrote the long telegram and the Mr. X article in such a way as to totally convince his audience and he, that, that it was necessary to contain the Soviet Union. And he wrote those two documents. They are emotion-provoking, basically sensationalized accounts. He basically, Kennan oversold the goods. And so he presented, presented the Soviet Union in 46, 47 as such an existential threat. So it was normal and, and understandable that many Americans and American leaders came to the conclusion that it was necessary for the United States to approach the Soviet Union, to contain the Soviet Union, not just with political and economic measures like the Marshall Plan, but also through increasing the American military, rebuilding the American military, building more atomic weapons, and so forth. Kennan hated that idea of the militarization of the Cold War. He had kind of set it up by presenting the Soviet Union as such an existential threat. But then, for years after, until finally in 1996, he admitted he'd been wrong in 1996 in an interview with David Gergen on TV. Kennan, aside from before that, Kennan asserted that he'd been misinterpreted. He'd not meant the Cold War to be pursued by the United States, policies to be pursued 
pursued through militarized measures. He had not meant for the United States to increase his military budget, had not meant for the US to build more atomic weapons. He just meant control, the Cold War to be pursued through economic and political measures. So John Gaddis bought into that argument that Kennan had meant containment to be political and economic, and Kennan prized that, that Kennan, the, the, Kennan prized that because Gaddis was his key to being going down in history the way Kennan wanted to go down in history. Okay, so Gaddis writes the authorized biography. But, but then Kennan himself, in deciding, as I said uh, earlier, that the Cold War had gone too far, certainly had become way too militarized, uh, the, the nuclear confrontation and the you know, mutual assured destruction, he thought was a terrible idea. So Kennan himself became more and more of a revisionist in terms of thinking, well, the Cold War is, is out of hand. We should negotiate with the Russians, as I said earlier. Yeah, and even as early as 1952, he was arguing that <clears throat> we didn't need to divide Germany. Maybe we should take seriously Stalin's peace note of 1952 that's that's, and demilitarize Central that's very Europe. True. That's very true. Uh, these Ken were radical ideas was. And he by was, the father of containment. That's right. And he kept all those ideas, both positions. So on the one hand, he wanted his record in 46, 47, 48 to be told correctly, that he had not meant it to be militarized. On the same token, when historians beginning 1959 and continuing into the 1960s, new, so-called new left historians, William Appam Williams and his uh, followers, started saying, well, you know, the United States had been too aggressive in terms of, in terms of uh, dealing with the Russians in 1945-46. The Cold War is, is the responsibility of the United States as well as the Soviet Union and so forth. That kind of talk by historians, particularly in the 1960s, that kind of discussion by historians ex uh, accelerated in, uh, by the Vietnam War and the general disillusionment with, with the Cold War that happened during the Vietnam War. Kennan regarded that criticism by the historians as threatening his legacy. So Kennan, again, that's why he turned to Gaddis, because Gaddis also weighed in, in various historical journals, weighed in to defend Kennan, to say that Kennan had meant containment not to be militarized, and, and in general, defending Kennan's record. So you have Kennan there, it's kind of a curious thing here, that he, He's critical of the origins of the Cold War, but not, not his part in it. He, he's innocent, it's everybody else. Yeah, but these new revisionists, people like Gar Alperwitz and William Appelman and Williams were essentially... Walter Lefebvre. Walter Lefebvre. Right, right. That, that uh, he was, uh, that his view of the Cold War was actually more realistic and more willing to see the Soviets as, as a adversary that could be economically and politically contained, and yet it was not necessary to contain them militarily and confront them with nuclear right, weapons. Right, but I think maybe maybe an oversimplified answer to what you just said is, that'd be okay if Kennan said that, he didn't want those historians saying that. It's okay for him to criticize it, but he didn't like, other people criticizing the, the, the origins of the Cold War. But these are really profound differences. And if you accept Kennan's view, for instance, on the question of whether Germany needed to be kept divided, uh, you know, that was very provocative when we took West Germany and put it into a, NATO, a military alliance called NATO, that was perceived as very threatening by the Soviets. Yes, it was, it was. I mean, I, actually, you know, you know the, the, the Soviet Union's nightmare throughout the Cold War is that a revived West Germany, and of course most of the economic power of, of pre-war Germany was in West Germany, revived West Germany would uh, draw on the nuclear power of the United States and seek revenge. That was a nightmare of the Russians consistently throughout, throughout the Cold War, down to 1990-91. So <clears throat> the, the implication of this in part is that if you accept Kennan's private views, his arguments, you know, how he saw containment, the Cold War could have been much less dangerous and it could have ended much earlier. That's right, that's what Kennan argued. I mean, he, 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 in the night, late night, as an example of many instances of Kennan pushing for an easing of the Cold War, but one of the most uh, famous was the so-called disengagement, disengagement campaign uh, 
uh, at the late 1950s. And Kennan gave a series of six lectures over the BBC in late 1957 that were a sensation. These lectures over the BBC, it's called the Wreath Lectures, uh, Kennan laid out an alternative to the Cold War, an alternative to the proposal, which was then in the, NATO was talking about, of installing nuclear weapons on, in East Germany, where NATO would install them in West Germany, the Russians would install nuclear weapons in East Germany, so you'd have nuclear weapons armed face to face on the German, German frontier. Kennan thought that was incredibly dangerous and a mistake. And he argued against that, and he argued that we should have negotiations with the Russians to, to, have, uh, to ease the arms race, try to limit, reduce the number of nuclear weapons, if not eliminate them. He pushed very hard for that. And the interesting thing is that those wreath lectures occurred at the same time there was a big NATO summit in late 1957. And reporters, and newspapers and so forth, said that more people, even at the NATO conference, were talking about Kennan and what he proposed than what the leaders of you know, Eisenhower and, and, and Dulles and, 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 the, and, and McMillan and, and the leaders of, of the NATO countries were, were proposing. And Nik Nikita Khrushchev, Premier Nikita Khrushchev, said publicly, Kennan has good ideas, we should try to negotiate on that basis. So that was a potential turning point, uh, but as a- Another missed opportunity. Yeah, missed opportunity. Uh, but I think you know, there's a reason why, the, what, this, this is oversimplified, but one of the reasons the Cold War, one of the reasons the Cold War persisted as long as it did is that it was, it was advantageous. It was advantageous for, uh, it was advantageous for the Russians who could point to their satellites and say the Germans are gonna get you unless we protect you. It was advantageous to the United States too in terms of keeping Germany as a willing, uh, and basically subservient partner of the United States as a way of maintaining American hegemony in Western Europe. And it, it also prolonged the dangerous arms race over nuclear weapons. And of course, Kennan was hired by Oppenheimer to come right. to the Institute for Advanced right. Study. And he was heavily influenced by Oppenheimer, who was himself, by 1952, right. was opposing the building right. of the hydrogen right. bomb and opposing right. an arms race, opposing having a defense established based on nuclear weapons, which was Eisenhower's right. policy. There's, there's a fascinating, and no one has to tell you this, there's a fascinating parallel between Kennan and Oppenheimer, because both of them, in a way, were responsible for the militarized Cold War. Oppenheimer with developing the atomic bomb, Kennan with the Mr. X article, and, and the uh, Mr. Yeah, Mr. X article, and the long telegram, both of them were responsible for initiating what developed, those tensions that developed, and both of them deeply humanitarian-minded people, both of them felt, I think, a measure of guilt about it, and tried to take steps to try to redress the, uh, the situation, and try to calm things down, try to turn things in a more sane direction, and both were frustrated that they were not able to do that, and both were basically repudiated by the establishment for their political stance. So at one point in your book, you quote the great biographer Ronald Steele, uh, writing in 2004 that containment was the least of Kennan's accomplishments. <laughs> and that struck me. And it's, it's true, though, in that you know, he, as you document, he was constantly sort of warning against American triumphalism, the whole idea of American exceptionalism. Wilsonian interventionism he thought was a dangerous strain in U U.S. foreign policy. And uh, these were all ideas that were deeply subversive of the foreign policy right. establishment. And it's because, I think, the, the deep underlying reason for this is that Kennan had, was, he was a conservative with a small c. He, he was not, he was, he was pessimistic. He was pessimistic about humans, human beings' uh, possibilities for doing great, wonderful things, or, or nations remaking other nations. He thought that the, what the United States should do is to be, as John Winthrop put it, to be a shining city upon the hill, and stay up on that hill. <laughs> but, but try to per perfect American society so the United States would be a model for other countries, rather than trying to impose uh, American values and other countries. So Kennedy cons consistently spoke out against American interventions. Famously, famously, um, there were, J. William Fulbright, the senator, had the televised hearings, uh, tele hearings for the Senate 
uh, in February 1966, and to, to Kennan spoke out against the, the, the Vietnam War. He was dressed very conservatively, a three-piece suit, a heavy gold chain. So here's kind of the figure, the father of containment, explaining why containment was not applicable in South Vietnam, why containment was, it was a mistake. And as late as 2003, 2003, when Kennedy was 99 years old, he wrote in his diary, well, I don't think the George Bush administration is going to consult me on Iraq, but if they did, you know, and, and actually he did, he did give a press conference in the apartment of a former Senator Eugene McCarthy in Washington, speaking out against the, the invasion of Iraq. So he was consistent, because he thought it wouldn't work. So Frank, why was he uh, both a critic of the Vietnam War in the 60s, and also a critic of the anti-Vietnam War protesters? Well, that's a good question. Um, and I talk about that a lot in the book. It's, okay, for Kennan, okay, for Kennan, style was important. Style, manner, how like you did. Like long it. hair? He didn't like long hair, particularly because his son had long hair. No, that's true. His son, I don't know if Chris is watching. Chris, don't be offended. Um, his son was, his son was born in 1949, was 20 in 19, uh, 19 in 1968. And his son was very much on the cultural left. And that, Kennan was upset about that. And, and also, he, Kennan, Kennan saw an exaggerated, exaggerated, the, uh, the violence of anti-war protesters exaggerated their, their uh, the degree of their rebelliousness. I think he, it just rubbed him the wrong way. He said seeing uh, students barefoot in Firestone Library was kind of like sacrilegious, you know. Uh, so I think it's the, it was the style. So that, that's what he objected, not the content, but the style. And then he went off, you know, Kennan tended to overdo things. Uh, the long telegram, Mr. X article was, was overdone. So he spoke at Swarthmore College in February 1968, basically de denouncing the anti-war protesters for being, uh, being ex too extreme and, and too violent and so forth. And that generated, as you know, a lot of, uh, th that was published as, the speech was sp published as an article in the New York Times Magazine. That generated a wave of letters, and that was those wet letters and Kennan's Response to the letters were collected in a book. Kennan also was, had an idea for the main chance, and there was a, another publication that was easily put together. So Kennan is also extremely relevant today um, because in the 1990s he became a fierce critic of the whole idea of the NATO expansion. And of course, this is uh, some people argue today that NATO expansion gave us the Ukrainian war. Yes, Kennan was it a, a very uh, deep, deep, uh, deeply opposed to the expansion of NATO. When the Soviet Union came apart in Christmas, Christmas time, 1991, Kennan was close to, still close to many American leaders, and particularly in the Clinton administration the, the following two years. Uh, Kennan was close with the Strobe Talbot, who was Bill Clinton's Russia expert. When, when Talbot, would, Talbot would come from Washington, drive from, travel from Washington up to the UN Assembly, General Assembly meeting every September. He would make sure he would drive rather than take the plane or train so he could bring with him a couple young foreign so service officers so they could stop in Princeton and talk to Kennan. So there's deep respect there that Talbot had for Kennan. And so there's a lot of exchange of letters there between Talbot and Kennan in the 1990s. So when the Soviet Union fell apart, Kennan's position, and this is a position not just of Kennan, but of many other people in the U.S. Senate, uh, people in German, German Foreign Ministry, and, and, and many people in Britain, the, the sentiment was, okay, the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet Union's falling apart, the Warsaw Pact is defunct, and NATO has also served its function as a Cold War alliance. Better, Kennan and these other people thought, better than keeping NATO going, or certainly better than expanding NATO, was establishing a European-wide military and security organization to which the United States could join that would be an effort to really finally, finally integrate Russia into the rest of Europe. And the Russians were receptive to this. So the idea was to erase that line between East and West. But that, unfortunately, was not the position that 
the United States followed. And it was a big debate. It was a big debate even within the Clinton administration and again within Congress. But instead the United States pursued the policy of expanding NATO first to Poland and the Czech Republic and Hungary and then on and on and on uh, into, into countries that either had been under the Soviet influence uh, in the Warsaw Pact or later countries, now independent countries that had once been part of the Soviet Union. And as Ken pointed out, and even as Strobe Talbot recognized and admitted, this was anathema, anathema to Russian officials before, before Putin came into, into, into office. Yeltsin and the people around him were deeply opposed to the expansion of NATO because they saw it as, as, as a, that at a time when Russia was weak, that the West was taking advantage. There's also the fact that there was a verbal promise there's a verbal promise when German reunification is being negotiated by James Baker and, and Germans and the British and French and the Russians, that NATO would not expand one the phrase was one in, inch further to the east. There was a verbal promise that was never put in writing, and that was a mistake that Gorbachev made in not getting it in writing. But that was definitely the verbal promise. So the Russians felt betrayed, betrayed that they had evacuated Eastern Germany, they had agreed to the reunification of Germany, and then NATO was being expanded. And so Ken had pointed this out. And just, it's, not, and it's way before 2014, way before Putin taking Crimea. In fact, in 1997, there were exchange of letters in 1997, when Kennan was complaining to Talbot that NATO was setting up naval exercises in the Black Sea, which is an area of great Russian concern. NATO was at, at naval exercises in the Black Sea to which it invited Ukraine and also Russia to participate. The Russians said they would not participate. But this is NATO getting involved with Ukraine in the Black Sea in 1997. So, and as Kennan wrote to Talbot, if we're trying to convince the Russians that the expansion of NATO is not detrimental to their interests, why are we engaging in these naval exercises with Ukraine in the Black Sea? Very provocative. So let's talk a little bit about the man. I mean, he's very interesting and complicated and uh, troubling at times. I mean, he's, his, uh, his neighbor at Princeton, Mary Acheson, the daughter of, of Dean Acheson, married to William Bundy, was a, a good friend and neighbor, and she discerned, you quote, a haunting sadness deep in him. Talk about his psychological moroseness. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think based on what I've seen the written evidence, and also what Kennan said to other people, that it's really, he never got over the loss of his mother. And it, it's, a, it's a story, it's kind of the, the meta-narrative of Kennan's life is that he lost his mother at the age of two months. It's a story that he told, emphasized to Gaddis in their first interview. It's a story that he emphasizes at the beginning pages of his memoir. It's a story that he, his daughter, Joan, interviewed him. It's a story he emphasized to her and, and to many other people. It was a haunting kind of sadness. Uh, and then, then also a the difficult uh, childhood in a way. That, as I mentioned, there was this rift between Kent Kennan and uh, the family of Kennan's mother. And this is the James family. Was, Kennan's mother was Florence James. And the James family adored George and his sisters. George spent a lot of time with the James family. Uh, his best friend was Charlie James, uh, his cousin. And so Kennan really had to negotiate between two families, his father and uh, the James family, you know, as a, as a kid. Also, it's a classic, <laughs> I won't say evil, but um, not uh, simpatico stepmother. Uh, a woman who really had a hard time dealing with boys, and that was, she even said that. Um, and so there was that, that problem. Uh, when he was, this I, I think is extraordinary anyway. When Kenneth was 13 years old, uh, he was taken out of school, skipped a grade, and taken out of school, it's, it's kind of slight for his age, and sent to a military boarding school that was um, specialized in problem boys. And, and some boys had actually been convicted of crimes. Um, and this was a rough place, overseen by a kind of very domineering uh, headmaster. So 
Why was Kenan sent to that, that particular school? I mean, it seems a little, he ran away more than once, uh, was sent back. So it was, it was difficult. And then, and then later, uh, he went to Princeton. And he, this is somebody with inherited money. He had inherited wealth, but he did not know that. He did not know that and pinched pennies. And he famously, in the memoir, he delivered the, in order to get money to go home his first year for Christmas, he delivered the, he went to Trenton, Princeton, of course, near Trenton, and he got a job delivering the mail, you know, the extra Christ, the Christmas mail. And as he says in the memoir, he had all these stacks of letters, and he's getting off the streetcar, and the bundle of, of letters broke. And um, so they were now in any kind of scattered order, they covered with snow and stuff, and he spent, worked into the night delivering those letters because they were, he had to go back and forth and back and forth because they were no longer in any order. And then he came down with scarlet fever. So um, there were some rough, rough points there. So he also had a very turbulent marriage and quite chaotic. Describe well, he his lived, relationship it was, they, with Annalise. It was 73 years. I mean, they were married a long time. Um, <laughs> but as their son put it, Chris, sorry about this. Uh, I guess uh, he was not sure whether they stayed married. But of course, it was, it was a different age. It was a different age. Um, it was a different age. The, George had, as he put it, a wandering eye. Uh, he was attracted. He's, he, what are the well, problems? I notice you talk, refer to his affairs. Well, he refers to them. But you don't actually name any names. He doesn't name any names. <laughs> So, you know, this is the person, is a, as I said before, style was important. It was be vulgar to mention any names, you know, even if people were deceased. So he doesn't mention any names. I mean, they're possible people, but he, he no, he's very, he writes about it a lot in the diary. Does a lot, writes a lot about sexual fantasies and so forth in the diary. Um, he had a special dream diary, which he kept, which had plain vanilla and not so plain vanilla sexual fantasies but no names. And in 1952, apparently, when he was ambassador to Moscow, he asked for the CIA to provide him cyanide poison capsules. That's the story. That we, this, is from, this is a testimony from someone who, um, it was like secondhand testimony. And when John Gaddis asked Kennan about that, why he had asked for the cyanide, he said he didn't know. But at, at there's, at some time, there's also Kennan saying at some point that he was afraid that if war broke out, if war broke out between the United States and Russia, which he was very fearful of, that he might be held and tortured. And, and, he, and, and I was, think Paul Nitze, one of his rivals uh, in the department, claims it was because he had gotten into some dame trouble and he wanted, he, he feared he was going to be blackmailed by Soviet intelligence. Well, there was some dame trouble, but I don't know if that was the reason for the uh, side. Anyway, complicated guy. So. Well, let's get into a little bit in the time we have left to, to explain his, his somewhat ar archaic notion of what he thought America was his, and his hostility and skepticism about multiculturalism, his anti-Semitism, his racist comments. Uh, I mean, he's homophobic too. I mean, you know, all, the, all <laughs> those all things. He, runs he, would be, he would be canceled today. This event would be canceled. Um, <laughs> I think we have to remember, as I said, Kennan is a package deal. He's a package deal. I mean, he, uh, uh, almost alone among the people who helped shape the Cold War, he's the one who came out against it. He's the one who's an early environmentalist. So, I mean, for me, that, you know, but that's, that's still, he was all those things. But I think we have to remember, as I said, a package deal. This is a person who was shaped by the early 20th century. He grew up in pre- World War I, Milwaukee. Uh, he was, then he, his first uh, early years in foreign service was in Riga. He was in pre-Nazi Berlin. which So these are areas where there was a lot of, certainly anti-Semitism, homophobia without, without and, and racism was just, uh, that was just normal, okay? The, the problem is that Kennan, I think moderated those views somewhat, but never totally abandoned them. And um, yeah, I mean, it's also like his notion about his anti-Semitism. I think that's kind of instructive. Kennan never 
got he, he loved Robert Oppenheimer, who was of course, Jewish, uh, yeah. And his, his <laughs> not that he hated Jews. His uh, his uh, literary agent Harriet Wasserstein or Wasserstrom was was Jewish, and many other people. But Kennan Kennan regarded being a Jew that that was it. There was a racial category. It was an ethnic category. There was a noun, you, which is like the pre World War II view, right? Like, certainly the German Nazi view that Jews Jews were. That was, a, that was a category, the noun, as opposed to the norm and post, certainly post-World War II America of being Jewish, which is part of your identity. For Kennan, but part of your identity, but not necessarily define it. But for Kennan, a Jew was a Jew. And, and, and I think that's part of his, the, the, the accounts that help, helps account for the, the way he would see that distinction, who is Jewish and who is not, in a way that most of us would not. I mean, some of the things that struck me in terms of this, was the Monica Lewinsky affair. Now, we, we all know, this is New York City, that um, Lewinsky is probably, probably a person, the last name of Lewinsky is probably Jewish. But, and we don't think anything of it. But Kennan, Kennan referred to the Jewish intern. You know? I mean, so there's that sense of, for him, it was identifying more than it would be for most other people. He, he, he had really sort of 19th century archaic views about almost everything. I mean, I think he thought America was too big. He, he, he had this prejudice against American car culture. He thought that the car was a, an evil thing. Right, <laughs> but not the two cars in his garage. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a measure of hypocrisy there. But okay, you know, it's part of, again, as I said, Kennan is a package deal. You know, I mean, he, what he, he favored, I mean, this is New York City again, he favored dense, nail, dense rail networks as opposed to, because with dense rail networks, people tend to live near the rail stations. That's conducive to community. People talk to each other on the train coming in and the train going home. Community was very important to Ken. I could say that again. Community was very important to him. Whereas auto travel, people spread out all, all over the place. I mean, there's that, is this, is our time is up, or? I, uh, <laughs> well, listen, is that canon coming through? I think it's time to take some questions, but okay. I, I want to say I just love this book. It's really Thank well you. written. It is deeply analytical, and you get at the complexity of this really smart intellectual who's a civil servant, who is a vehicle for understanding uh, the Cold War, and he was right about so many things. If he was wrong in in his yeah, let, me, let me just follow up with did finish up with two things in terms of community. Okay, now Kennan noticed. I mean, there'll, there'll, some people in this audience are old like I am. I remember back when you had to when you made a telephone call, you had to pick up. You picked up the telephone and you asked the operator to connect you, right? And then we had direct dialing. Well, Kennan said. Well, that's a loss. Even though, even though that was impersonal interaction with whoever the operator was, it was some interaction, and then you lose that. So I think what's you're right. He's right about many things. I think today that we we can appreciate more someone who says, well, you know, automation and technology and impersonal relations leave something to be desired, and I th and so his way 19th century, or as he put it, 18th century, but there's something to be said for that. So let's take some questions. I have a question. Um, oh, thank you. How did the um, communist takeover of China and North uh, Korea invading South Korea uh, affect his thinking about, uh, his revisionist thinking about the Cold War? Well, Kennan was, was, that was part of, during the time, his transitioning out of the government. So after the North Korean invasion of South Korea, Kennan was called back to consult with other people in the State Department in 1950. And Kennan recommended that the United States defend South Korea, but he was against going, crossing uh, the 30th parallel into North Korea because he thought that would be too dangerous. Well, and Kennan, in general, in general, thought that the United States he, regard, he had a lot of respect for what we call Chinese civilization, and he generally thought the United States should have a hands-off attitude toward China, 
And in particular, he was, in later years, in the 90s, he was against the United States becoming too economically dependent on China. <clears throat> Hi, Frank. Um, first of all, Kai, the position that Cannon took on the war and the protesters was the majority position in the United States for a long time. People opposed to the war, but they liked the protesters even less. And it, I think it extended the support for the war. Um, Frank. Are you, is this Eric? Yeah. Uh, hi. When I, uh, when, I, when I was reading your book, I was thinking about my, my late friend Ron Steele's book, because it was the last book that I felt did the job that you were doing of, of telling the intellectual and political history, well, also some of Kai's books, um, that uh, t t tells the story, the whole story of the intellectual history of US foreign policy at the same, same time you're telling the story of the man. And, um, and when Ron died, I wrote a little piece about him where I compared him to Kennan, because they're both conservatives, small c, that end up sounding like liberals because conservatives aren't conservatives in this country. Um, I want, I'm asking you about, I know that they had that um, exchange when Lipman wrote those 14 columns about the Cold War, but I'm asking you if they had any other kind of relationship. I'm, I'm sure they respected each other. They did, they yeah, did. So can you they, talk about that? Yeah, they did. They did respect each other. And uh, they did exchange letters, and they did get together every once in a while. Um, there's a very interesting passage uh, in the book. It's in the Kennan diary. When, when Kennan was, was at the Washington National Cathedral for the memorial service for Walter Lippmann. And, and I think it was, it, it's very revealing, more of Kennan than of Lippmann. When he says, Kennan says, well, you know, Lippmann, he had, he had, Lippmann and I both kind of rank equally in terms of our understanding of foreign affairs, but uh, my understanding even went deeper than Lippmann's. But Lippmann had, Lippmann had more influence with the American public. So, you know, the Lippmann had influence in the American public that Kennan, Kennan did not. Uh, so I think there was a certain amount of jealousy there that he felt that he was Lippmann's equal, but it not, was not Lippmann's, is he, Lippmann's equal in talent, but not Lippmann's equal in terms of influence. Um, but he certainly did respect Lippmann a lot. I'm uh, interested in uh, what kind of relationship Kennan had with certain secretaries of state. And I'm thinking particularly of Marshall, uh, John Foster Dulles, and, um, and Atchison. And, uh, you know, less pivotally, pivotally, excuse me, I'm curious if, if he had any kind of relationship with the presidents, particularly Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy. Okay, that's an easy question. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, George Marshall, I think he had the best relationship with Marshall. I mean, Marshall was a person who liked staff work, and basically Marshall chose Kennan with, with some input from James Forrestal. Marshall chose Kennan to be the policy planning staff director, and Kennan's office was next door to Marshall's, which is an incredible achievement. I mean, Kennan, two years, doesn't May 47, he became director of the policy planning staff with his office next door to Secretary of State George C. Marshall. Two years earlier, Kennan had just been in Moscow, or a year and a half earlier, he had just been in Moscow as a second, second uh, uh, place official. So that was the best. And then when Atchison came in, Atchison regarded Kennan as just, just another advisor, but not the advisor that Marshall did. And so, Kennan's influence with Atchison was much less, and also they began to differ on something Kai brought up about what to do with Germany. The issue was, should the United States unify the three western zones of Germany, the, the American, British, and French zones, into a West Germany that could develop economically and perhaps even militarily and be a strong ally of the United States, or, that's what Atchison wanted, or should the United States negotiate with the Russians to reunify Germany all of Germany as a kind of demilitarized neutral neutral country. Uh, that's what Atchison preferred, uh, that's what Kennan preferred, but not Atchison. So there's differences in policy between Kennan and Atchison. Also Atchison, uh, as Kai knows supremely well, Atchison came to favor the building of the super, the hydrogen bomb, something else that Kennan opposed, as did Oppenheimer. 
Then we get a whole different kettle of fish between Kennan and John Forster Dulles. Uh, Kennan hated Dulles. Um, but you, because, and we could go into it, but Dulles, when Dulles became Secretary of State in January 1953, he, he didn't just not give Kennan a job. He didn't just ignore Kennan and not give him a position, but he kept him hanging kept him hanging for months and months. So Kennedy was literally twisting in the wind, waiting, by, literally by the phone, his daughter recalled, waiting for a phone call that he, what would be his position in the new administration. And he, Dulles never called, and finally, Dulles asked Kennedy to come in, and Dulles told Kennedy, who had served in the Foreign Service at this point since 1926, is 1953, so he'd served all those 27 years, uh, Dulles told Kennan that there was no niche, and that's the word he used, there was no niche in the State Department for Kennan. And of course, one reason was that Dulles was advocating rollback, rollback of, the, of communism in Eastern Europe, which Kennan had advocated containment. And, and presidents? Oh, presidents. I mean, Kennan had met with Truman, you know, but Truman was really not, Truman was, left foreign policy primarily to Atchison um, and to Marshall. So there was some interaction there, but not a whole lot. Uh, Eisenhower and Kennan knew each other fairly well, but Eisenhower basically, yeah, Eisenhower and, and Kennan knew each other fairly well. And there the, the story is that, okay, so Dulles was advocating rollback of communism. But what does that actually mean? <laughs> if you're gonna really roll back the Soviets from Hungary and East Germany, that means a war. And Eisenhower didn't want a war. So, but he had this, Dulles was kind of his attack dog during the McCarthy era. So Dulles and Nixon were Eisenhower's attack dogs. So then, so they were elected and now Eisenhower had to do something with this guy favoring rollback who's his secretary of state. So Eisenhower is again, supreme savvy politician. A, uh, conducted a, a vast study of American foreign policy, or commissioned a vast study of American foreign policy that lasted two or three months. It was called the Solarium, Solarium Project, because they met in the Solarium uh, of, of, of the White House. And all the you know, top officials and former officials met to discuss what should be American policy uh, toward the Russians and other issues. And basically, long story short, they concluded that rollback was too dangerous and that containment should be the policy of the new administration, except they just kept the name rollback. And, and so Kennan, and Kennan was a key, key person in that solarium exercise. So what I'm basically saying here is that Eisenhower tapped Kennan's expertise, even as he kept Dulles, who had this uh, poisonous relationship with Kennan. And the final thing here is that when Kennan was invited back to the State Department, and I think in the 1990s, when Madeleine Albright invited invited him back, what's Kennan thinking about? Oh, well, that goddamn Dulles. He, you know, I mean, it, after Dulles had been dead for years, dead for 40 years, Kennan was still fuming over it. And, and if I can say, Kennedy, and did he have any kind of relationship with Nixon when Nixon was in Congress and vice president? No, he didn't with Nixon, but he did with Kennedy. Actually, there was kind of a warm relationship there. Um, well, I'd say warm. I think Kennan thought it was warmer than it was. I think Kennedy saw Kennan, Kennedy, JFK saw Kennan as someone who was, had an alternate viewpoint, someone you should consult, but ultimately not listen to. I think that's, that's not. Uh, he did I, appoint him ambassador. Yeah, he appointed him ambassador, right. He appointed him ambassador, gave him the choice of Yugoslavia or Poland. I mean, those are important countries. Whereas Chip Boland, who was with Kennan, you know, in, in, as in Russia during all these years, and FDR's interpreter, the other main Russian expert, Chip Boland became ambassador to France. And Chip Boland was also called into the Cuban Missile Crisis, which Kennan was not. And, and one other thing is that, um, I think it was like February 1961, something like that, there was a big meeting, or maybe even late January 1961, there was a big meeting in the White House where Kennedy wanted to really hash out what should be our policy toward Russia. And Chip Boland was there, Foy Kohler was there, uh, major people, but Kennan was not invited. So I think, yeah. But, but Isn't it? Kennan, Kennan adored Kennedy, but I think it was not quite reciprocated. <laughs>
Isn't it, isn't it also true that um, in the late 1940s, Kennan himself took part in some covert schemes against the Soviet Union? Um, he did. He helped. psychological strategies behind the Iron Curtain. So, he did. He so did. he himself wasn't entirely consistent with sticking with containment in the that, containment that's very era, true. right? That's very true. I think, I think it's, that's very true. He worked with Frank uh, Wisner, uh, part of the CIA operations. I think the Kennan, my way of understanding that, is that Kennan, again, just think about the ego boost it was from somebody who had been an obscure official who had been trying to make it in the big time and then suddenly was in the big time. I think Kennan went along with the wave of Cold War militancy more than he later liked to admit. Okay, one or two more questions, and then we should end this. I, oh, um, oh, thank you. Um, around 1991, when the Soviet Union was falling apart, and um, I, I mean, uh, someone economist up at Columbia and had great influence and, and thought that the Russians should go through shock therapy. I mean, it, it just seemed... Did, did, Jeffrey did, Sachs. Did, 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 well, uh, Jeffrey, Sachs. Jeffrey Sachs, right. Um, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, it just, I, I wonder what, how Kennan weighed in on that. He thought that, that was crazy. Yeah. He thought that was crazy. He thought that, that we could not remake Russia in our image. Russia had to find its own path toward democracy. And that if we, if we wanted to make Russia into a friend, we should be careful, but also help them, help, help them economically. And so I think basically Kennan was disappointed with the policy that, that we did follow. What would Kennan think of, the, of Putin today? And Russia today and the war in Ukraine? I would think he would see that the present situation is a very dangerous one and that the United States should really move toward pushing for negotiations. I think that's, that's clear from other things he said. And, 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 and you know, one, one of the things that Kennan, one of the things he did do is that in 1951, and this is with the support of the State Department, but in 1951, Kennan secretly approached the, U, the Russian ambassador to the UN and they basically hashed out what would be the parameters of each side's participation in the Korean War and how to move toward an eventual armistice. So Kennan, again, believed in democracy. Democ not democracy, diplomacy. Diplomacy. That diplomacy is essential. And what he meant by diplomacy is professionals, not summit meetings where it's all hoopla. Professionals who understood each other's cultures meeting secretly, patiently, no timetable, and trying to, to arrive at compromise. And that, you could have some military pressures there, but the important thing was to try to arrive at a meeting of minds. Yeah, and he, this is a man who really spent years studying the Russian language and the culture, and he acquired a deep you know, love of, of Russia and things Russian. Right. So he, 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 was in, he was the sort of classic form Foreign Service Officer, in that sense. On that note, maybe we should end. Thank you all for coming. This is a terrific book. <laughs>